I have the dubious task of dealing with the hard stuff, so I'm not going to give you a whole preamble. The song set it up wonderfully. So today I want to talk to you about our next question, which was submitted concerning racism. What does God say about racism? What does God say about racism? I'll give you a few announcements at the end of this sermon. But if you have your handouts, go ahead and pull them out, and we will go from there. What does God say about racism? Let me begin by saying to you, this is probably, of all of the topics we've discussed, for me, is one that is very difficult. It's very difficult because sometimes we think that because we're in the 21st century, racism has gone away. That racism has become undone. The fact of the matter is, it hasn't become undone like God wants it undone. It just went underground. Uh, the racism of today is more s- systematic. It's more hidden. There's more marketplace racism than ever before. Uh, there is uh, segregation by class, elitism, money. And so it's here. I know we'd like to have a great kumbaya because when we can say it's been solved, we don't have to deal with the problem. But the reality of it is is that the problem is still, it still exists because we don't love people like we ought to love people. Now, I'm not talking to the unsaved world. I'm really dealing with the church. Uh, Because although the world has its issues, I can't hold them to a standard because they're they're under a different law. But I'm talking to the Christian world where there is racism in the Christian world because some of your friends at work go to church and, 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 and they have views that are not biblical and they justify themselves because they live out yonder and they will say I'm not racist I work with blacks well you have to Oh, I'm not racist. I work with whites. Well, you have to. Well, I'm not racist. I work with Hispanics. Yes, for those who didn't know, racism goes across every spectrum, color, and creed. It goes across every spectrum, color, and creed. I want to share a story with you about me in particular. Coming out of East St. Louis, 99.9999999% black. I was blessed to go to the University of Missouri, Columbia, which is two and a half hours away from here, which is 97.5555555% white. And being there on a campus of 26,000 kids and only 3,000 are African American, I had to adjust my worldview. Yes, I have been around whites before, but mostly in the mall, passing them by. Mostly at a stadium, sitting next to them, but cheering for one team. But at college, I had to intermingle. And I found that I had some views in my heart that wasn't right. I'll never forget my, my, my dorm neighbor. Named guy named Jeff, white, white guy from Pilot Grove, Missouri, which is another 45 minutes west of Columbia. Pilot Grove has about 10 houses. And all of them are farms. And so I didn't know this about him, but I had a view that he hated me and we never had a conversation. I mean, it's amazing when you, when you are struggling with views that go unchecked in life, you begin to assume and generalize another person's thought and heart without ever engaging them in conversation. So he gave me a look that I thought was unbecoming of a dude from East St. Louis. He's about to get his head busted. And Jeff 
became one of my best friends. We got to talking, and I had to confess, man, I had some issues with you. He said, I had some issues with you. Then he said, won't you come to my house? Didn't know where he stayed. He said, Polly Grove. I said, cool, y'all go cook. I'm good. We're driving, man, and we get to Polly Grove, and it says Polly Grove left. Make, make a, you're going south of Highway 70. And I mean, we are traveling. I see one house, and then for the next 15 miles, it's not a house to be seen. We pull in, and I'm like, Jesus, if I don't, if I die, <laughs> die, Jesus. We pull into this, well, I saw cows. I, a city boy didn't see cows. And he had a farm. We go into his house, and I meet his daddy who had some overalls, some coveralls or some overalls on, those jean ones that looked like it had dirt smudges all over them. And then, and then he had a book in the corner with Rush Limbaugh's face. I said, oh, my God. I'm going to have to fight my way up out of here. And it just so happened I know how to hotwire a car. I'm gone. And his father had some issues. Problem was, we spent almost a half a day at his house, and I'm looking at his father, and his father looking at me. I'm looking at his father, his father looking at me. He's about 320. I'm 155. I said, we can do this. <laughs> so then he asked me a political question. What think ye of our country? Are you a Democrat? I said, are you a Republican? Because his assumption was because I'm black, I'm Democrat. My assumption was because he had Rush Limbaugh. I had a little more intel on him. I was at his house that he was Republican. I said, God bless America, my home, sweet home. Racism still exists. The worst kind of racism is being in a job where you are producing, you are doing what it's required at an excellent level, and you get skipped over because of color. Or you get skipped over because, well, you have a certain way of saying stuff, or you have a different spin on life. It's a sad reality of where we're living that although we have advanced in technology, we got this little rover on Mars, and all of these great advancements, we still can't cross the street and love one another. Let me deal with the definition of prejudice. To be prejudiced means having adverse judgment or opinion formed beforehand or without knowledge of examination of the facts. I prejudge you without facts. A preconceived preference, idea, or a bias. Well, tied to the word prejudice, those who have been prejudged can also become racist. The oppressed can become equally dangerous in their views of those that oppress them. That can be found in the word name, a bigot. It is a prejudiced person who is intolerant of any opinions differing from their own or intolerant of people of different political views, ethnicity, race, class, religion, profession, sexuality, or gender. So we've got to be careful on both hands that although wrongs have been exercised, as Christians, we've got to show for love and acceptance that this is God's creation, whom God loves dearly. So brothers and sisters, let me just give you an example of what I'm talking about. I'm going to test your ears when you hear the news. What do you think about? Man found with nine guns in Buick Regal having shot three people, black or white. Man with a cache of 10,000 rounds of ammunition found at his home, black or white. Banker swindles millions from employees and bank, black or white. Van gets pulled over heading to Chicago. There are 14 people, I'm sorry, there are 34 people in the van. <laughs> Y'all are so wrong. 
children of disobedience. <laughs> Why is stereotyping bad? It's bad because it hurts people. See, God has positioned us that I mean something to you. I mean something uh, to my bosses. I mean something in corporate America. I mean something in the educational system. I am not here because somebody gave me a pass. I'm not here as a lesser than. And your views are not greater than. We've got to understand that the greater is the Holy Spirit, which allows us to exist and allows us to love supernaturally. Why well, stereotypes bad is because even when they are correct, it causes people not to miss out on helping others. It causes people. When I was at Columbia, it was really racially tense. I mean, it was, it was deep. Um, I got some actually college mates that, that attend this church. I don't know if they're here, but anybody here from Mizzou that went to Mizzou, raise your hand. Okay. I'm testifying that there was some deep racial tensions in 1995 to 2000. I'm not talking 40 years ago, where at the Black Student Union Hall, they hung a black doll during Black History Month, painted on the wall the word nigger. This is recent. We had to embark upon that. We had to deal with kids that came from communities that never intermingled with the other race and vice versa. So my issue is, yes, it is alive and it is well, but my only indictment is not to the world. It's to the churches that talk their political jargon on Sundays that talk about how they love Jesus, but let someone of a different race into the doors of their church. I don't believe nowhere in the world there should be a homogenous church unless in the radius of 50 miles there's not another race in that community. God is not about homogeneity. Everything looking the same. He never created one plot of land the exact same way as another. My brothers and sisters, I'm going to give you top, the top 10 racial stereotypes. Number 10, white people don't have rhythm. There's some black folk that don't have rhythm. I don't know who they are. But I got soul. I got soul. Number nine, African Americans are good at basketball. Can we just do a taste test, a test case study in our audience? Who can be honest enough to say that ain't my thing? See that? Okay, let's keep going. All Asians are geniuses. Some of y'all cheated off of some of your Asian brothers in college. <laughs> Found out that ain't true. <laughs> Number seven, Hispanics don't speak English very well or not at all. So very not true. I know some folk been in America all their life, don't know how to speak English very well or at all. <laughs> Have y'all ever heard Flavor Flav talk? <laughs> Cookie boy! This was I! You came from the planet Mercaton? <laughs> Number six, Native Americans love to gamble. It's not true because I got Native American in me and I don't love to gamble. Number five, all Asians know Kung Fu. <laughs> I don't know about y'all, but I've seen a few clips on YouTube where they got knocked out. <laughs> Number four, African Americans only like fried chicken. <laughs> when I go to KFC, I don't just see folk that look like me. 
Brother Parker, we've been, we've been with each other for over 10 years. You like fried chicken, Brother Parker? Just wave at everybody. Let everybody know. You like fried chicken? <laughs> Just say, my name is Brother Parker, and I like fried chicken. <laughs> See, Stereotypes are horrible, man. I remember suffering from this in corporate settings. When I first got hired in corporate America, man, they had a banquet and had fried chicken. I wouldn't go near it. They had a fruit ball. They had watermelon. I wouldn't go near it. Real talk, because I didn't want to be categorized any further as being less than. And I started sitting there, but the chicken was gone, and the watermelon was eaten up, and I didn't touch it. Amen, amen. And I'm just to be on the witness stand. I love fried chicken, and I love watermelon, and I eat watermelon until the season goes out. And I don't care what nobody think about it. Somebody say something to me, I'm saying, your mama. Now, go somewhere. <laughs> go down the road somewhere. Yeah, uh-huh. In fact, I'll go old school, your yeah, mammy. Now, I like watermelon. <laughs> I will not let foolishness dictate my happiness. Number three, Middle Easterners hate America. Number two, all white people are racist. Not true. Brother Parker, you started with me 10 years ago when it was four of us, five of us. You was driving in East St. Louis at night <laughs> for, from 2001 till we moved in 2007. Never got mugged. Never got mishandled or mistreated. All white folk ain't racist. It's because of he and his wife that I'm here today. Believe that. Believe that. His wife who, who passed on and she's with the Lord um, is because of that family who looked at me and said, you can't quit. We believe in you. And I'm like, if y'all from Iowa and you believe in this naphead boy from East Boogie and you saying you believe in the mission of this church when I was five on a good day and ten on Easter, And I mean, they supported me, brought me into their home, brought me around their friends, and loved me, and cared for me. Real talk. And cared for me. And to this day, cares for this ministry. To this day. And number one, top ten racial stereotype Hispanics are all illegal aliens. And we don't have to go very far. If you come out this parking lot and make a left, that's Fairmont City, little Hispaniola. And, 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 and honestly, most folks would say, man, they must have jumped over the fence. We have these stereotypes that injure our ability to help love and lift people up. And, and it's stupid because it's easier to have a stereotype because you don't have to do no research. You want to talk about racial tension? Go to this next slide. Tell me what you think. This presidential race has stirred the pot of racial tension. And it ain't over with yet. Wait till the debates. I mean, it, some folk are making policy that, well, I don't like Obama's policy. And they're using the justification of I don't agree to this policy to talk about race. You're a liar. You're, your heart ain't right. Yo, you just, just be honest with you. And when Bush was in there, that was the folk that talked about Bush in a racial tone. Let's just be real. Let's not fake it. Let's not fake it. But you know what's interesting to me is the stuff this dude has gone through in four years blows my mind. Stuff you, ne you, you never thought you'd hear mention about a president said of him. Sad. Sad. We want him out. Not because he did wrong. I don't agree with everything he's done. But he inherited a mess. And I don't teach politics. I'm just talking about, I just think it's unfair. I just think it's unfair. Let's go, that's nationally. Let's go locally. Go to this next one. This is a map of the metropolitan area. See if that's, okay, this is, this is big enough. As we, we are right here. Y'all see that dot? We are right here. That's where Collinsville is. 
on this map, this area is fragmented racial. Uh, you want to go to a place, go to South County, it's about a 90% likelihood that it's all white. You want to go to a place all black, go to North County, around this area up in here. You want to go to where uh, uh, the Jews stay and, the, and those of the uh, Jewish faith go right in the U City area all the way out to Creve Cole, all the way out to Chesterfield. You want to go with a black state? You, yeah, you're about right. Right here, North County, St. Louis City, and that area right there. It's a fragmented area. And I'm talking strong distinctions just 30 minutes away. Strong distinctions. And a lot of these, again, I ain't talking to the world. I'm talking to those who say, I love Jesus. And hold views that are racist. Black to white, and white to black, and black to black, and white to white. Because then there's a fragmentation within each race about who has money, middle, upper, lower. In the black race, middle, upper, and lower. So if I, as an African-American man, decide that I'm going to move because I don't want to be in East Boogie and I don't want to get shot. If I decide, yes, it's, a, it's not too much of a generalization. I got Belleville News Democrat articles to prove it. But anyway, um, Point being is there's a likelihood there, right? If I go to the suburbs and move into a community that tends to be more white and folks start putting for sale signs up, that's a problem. Because now I'm being generalized and stereotyped as a bad element. Oh, Jesus, help me, Lord. Um, when you hear the media today, you hear a lot about entitlement programs. And I, and I believe that some of it needs to be reduced. I do. But not when in, some of us made it because of an entitlement. In fact, we talk about entitlements to citizens. What about those corporate entitlements? What about TIFs? That's another entitlement. Tax increment financing where a Walmart can move into an area and not have to pay taxes locally for a number of years. Is that not an entitlement? So don't look at the guy or the gal that's trying but didn't have the resources to make it and they need help. So when we hear entitlements, let's look at the statistics because I guarantee you when you hear it in the news, here's the implication. Let's go to this next one here. Click on this for me. The racial breakdown of food stamps recipients is as follows. 41% of, of food stamp recipients are white, 36% black, 18% Hispanic, 3% Asian. Now, hopefully that just turned things upside down for you. Now, some may say, well, the population differences, yeah, I'm with you on all of that, but don't think for one minute that everybody don't need help all I'm saying. But multiculturalism, this church, we have whites, we have blacks, we have Hispanics, we have people who of mixed cultures, we have people uh, with Asian blood in them, and I'm so excited because that's been my heartbeat all the way back when I first started. All the way back when I first started. Come on, give God some praise. Y'all all stand. Because I believe any church that does not have an open door to anybody is not a church God is blessing. In fact, it's a church that God does not enjoy being a part of. A church that prides itself on being homogenous is a church not built on biblical principles. A church that prides itself on being just us and no more is a church that God will not bless to the full potential that he wants to bless it. Multiculturalism is God's idea. I want to see more folk of different races embarking upon this church. One day, I'd love to have a Hispanic service. One day, I'd love to have such a, 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 a hodgepodge of cultures because then we can change the world around us. Change the world around us. Which means you got to do the job of inviting people that don't look like you to church. You got to do the job. 
I mean, if they can invite you to happy hour, you can certainly say, come to my church. Multiculturalism is God's idea. In fact, in your handouts, Revelation 79 puts it this way. This is how heaven go look. So if you don't like it, you might as well just say, hey, I'm going to hell. Look what it says. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. From every what? What? People and language. Standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were all saved. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. It didn't say there was a white sec session, a section, a black section, a Hispanic section. It said they were all standing together before the lamb that was slain. That's how heaven is going to look. There will not be a denominational section. Oh, I'm Baptist. I'm Pentecostal. I'm Church God Christ. I'm of the first, fourth foundation of the southern mission of the north tribe of Egypt. Jesus only churches. None of that either. None of that either. None of that either. You know, I used to talk to people, and the first thing they say is, what church they go? I don't care. I'm back. I don't care what you are. Are you saved? I care what you are. I don't care what you brought up. I'm glad you was in church. But let's get back to race. Notice what the Bible says. That first of all, there was a multitude that no one could count, which means church should always grow. And if church starts growing, it means it has to grow with people that look differently than you. From every nation, from every tribe, from every people, and even every language. Standing before the throne, worshiping. Y'all see that? That's multiculturalism is God's idea. Wasn't invented by man, it's God's idea. Care, I don't care how we want to make justification for our comfort zone. Multiculturalism is God's idea. I remember, man, my, my brother, one of my older brothers uh, uh, in college was dating a white girl that was uh, going to be the next wife of his, or the wife of his. And in Chicago, he went to Northern Illinois University, a place called DeKalb, Illinois. Anybody know DeKalb? Okay, he went there. So I spent a lot of time up there. Her name was Heather. Heather was the kindest lady I ever met. Heather had some parents that lived in Naperville. Anybody know Naperville? Naperville, Illinois. Her parents told her, if you marry him, we're cutting you out the wheel. She chose money over love. She chose money over love. And the bad part about it is, they deep in the church. Deep in the church. Like, they make decisions and the church follow them. And that's his worldview. And uh, multiculturalism is God's idea. Let me move quickly. Jesus encountered racism in his ministry. He encountered a whole lot of racism between Jews and non-Jews in his ministry. The Jews had this belief system that because they had been oppressed and because they had been uh, sideswiped by some bigger nations that God favored them better than anybody else. And although Jesus had to deal with this reality and although God did favor them, he had to break down some mindsets that developed that were not biblical or godly. Jesus taught that Jewishness alone was no guarantee of favor with God. See, Jews thought that because I'm Jew, I automatically get favor with God. Jesus said, no, 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 not so. Not so at all. God is no respecter of persons. Jesus had another culture clash. He taught that the temple would be destroyed because they said, oh, worship is from the Jews. Remember Jesus' encounter with the woman at the well? And she says, you Jews say salvation is from y'all. Jesus said, hold up, mm -mm. I'm destroying the physical temple because I want you all to know that worship will be centered in the heart, will be centered in the heart. In fact, in that conversation with that woman at the well, he makes it very clear to his disciples. In that day and time, the Jews would not walk through Samaria. Samaria was a Gentile nation of half-breed Jews and Gentiles. Somebody stepped over the fence and saw a Gentile woman and liked her who was Jewish. They had babies, and it began a process. 
They became known as the Samaritans. So the Jews in Israel said, we, if you walk through Samaria, you are considered unclean. Unclean for a Jew meant you couldn't worship at the temple, which was a central aspect of their living. So what they would do instead of walking through Samaria to go north, they would walk sometimes 14 days around what should have taken just three day trip. Racial at racial stereotyping and uh, 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 racism will cause you more pain than it does gain. Jesus says to his disciples, I must needs go through Samaria. Why? He wanted to show them we've got to start breaking the racial tension. He goes and he meets a woman. He witnesses to this woman. This woman goes back to Samaria, uh, the, the downtown area of Samaria, and the entire city is saved. When we stay within our comfort zone, church, we miss out on saving a city. We miss out on saving a city. Jesus even taught that a kind Samaritan or a repentant tax collector was better than a pious but proud Pharisee. He also taught that he also granted healing to Gentiles and ate in the homes of outcasts. Jesus dealt with racism head on. So let's talk about how to combat racism in the book of Acts. There is this whole battle between the Jews and the Gentiles. The church begins growing in an enormous way. And Peter is kind of the head dude of the church. Paul is now saved. He's no longer Saul. The church is under a massive anointing of growth. And people are being saved, set free, and delivered to the point that the Jews thought we can now reclaim our heritage. And then God got the nerve to give Peter a dream in Acts 10 told him, Peter, I need you to wake up and eat. And there on this table was all kinds of four-footed beasts. And for a Jew, that's considered unclean eating against the dietary code of the Levites. And so God speaks to him in the dream and says, wake up and eat. Peter says, Lord, I ain't never tasted nothing unclean. God says, don't you dare call unclean what I have cleaned. He says, there's a man coming to your door. You better answer the door and go with him to a man's house who is a Gentile by the name of Cornelius. Gets down there to Cornelius' house, man starts preaching. But Peter has racist issues. He hates the Gentiles. Thinks they are the scum of the earth. That they are nothing but people who get entitlements and that kind of mindset. So even though Peter was with Jesus when he was talking to the woman of Samaria and he broke down the racial barriers, Peter still had this thing embedded in his heart. You can work around other races. You can eat breakfast with other races. You can break bread with other races. You can work with them. You can do projects with them. You can study with them. But the question I have, what is in your heart? What's in your heart? He was with Jesus, but he had racist ideologies in his heart. He didn't get the point that Jesus is here to save all Creeds, colors, languages, all people. So he gets the test number two. And thank God he was patient with Peter. Peter had a cussing problem and a racist problem. I mean, thank God he didn't eliminate that brother because some of us would have cut him out. And so Peter is now going to Cornelius' house. And the first thing he says, y'all know Jews and Gentiles don't hang out. But God sent me to your house. Peter begins to preach about Jesus, and the Bible says the Holy Ghost fell on them like Acts 2, verse 1 through 4. The, they begin to speak in other tongues, and now let me help all these folks who are sign happy understand what Acts 2 mean and Acts 10 mean. Why did God let Acts 10 with the Gentiles happen like Acts 2 with the Jews? Remember who was the messenger, Peter. Peter had to know that God loved the Gentiles equal to the Jews. He had to give him a similar experience in Acts 10 like there was in Acts 2. So Peter could have no doubt in his heart that God loved the Gentiles just like he did the Jews. Now that's free for y'all, but you can take that with you and run down the road. So here in Acts 15, there is some hypocrisy that comes up. 
Although God did this powerful thing, the Jews at Jerusalem have issues. Look what it says in Acts 15, 8 and 9. It says, God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. This is Peter talking. Just, that's the key word, just as he did to us. Because God didn't want to leave any doubt in Peter's mind that he is a God of many nations. He did not discriminate between us and them, but he purified their hearts by faith. Look at that. God did not discriminate between us and them, but he saved them by faith. He did not discriminate, but he saved them by faith. So let me give you some ways to combat racism. Number one, get informed. Get informed. A bigot is a person that refuses to listen to another person's ideas listens to another person's views. A bigot is a person that refuses to cross the street. When people say, all I listen to is MSNBC, all I listen to is Fox News, stop it. Because it ain't all that. It's full of lies and rumors of lies. See, don't worry about what happens in the political realm, church. Worry about what happens in the spiritual realm, church. It, 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 it makes me sick that when Election time come, you hear churches doing more political campaigning than they should, than they should be doing, uh, uh, speaking the gospel so souls can be saved. Yeah, yeah. You know what the Bible says about the church's responsibility politically? Pray. But we've outsourced prayer, and we just want to pontificate. We want to we wanna get intoxicated with the pulpit and bash our views over people's heads. You smart. We teach you enough. You'll learn what you need to do. Trust the people. Lead the people to Christ. And Christ will lead them to their decisions. So here's the deal. God did not discriminate. But that was a big issue that came aboard. So God says, y'all need to get informed. If you want to learn about how God wants a multicultural view, yes, you, you, and you, get informed. Be willing to have lunch with somebody of a different race. Be willing to invite someone of a different uh, uh, skew and hue into your life. Be willing to get informed. Don't make judgment calls and you never met them, never spoke with them, never engaged them in any real conversation. Look what the Bible says about the, uh, about the apostles in Acts 15. It says, because of this hypocrisy between the Jews and the Gentiles, this brought Paul and Barnabas into a what? Sharp dispute with them. So they were appointed along with some other believers to go up to Jerusalem and see the apostles about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Galatia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. They told people, look, here's what's been happening. Notice that last sentence. Here's what who's been doing? He said, this ain't a us thing. This is a God thing. It's a God thing when racists get together without these superior and inferior views. It's a God thing when we can break bread and love each other. Because guess what? I need you and you need me, whether you like it or know it or not. We need each other because, listen, even when it comes to worship in the church of God, let's, uh, your, your, listen, your style might have been. Hallelujah. Great. Didn't make it right. It didn't make it the right way. See, when we get together as racists get together, we provide, we, we provide our unique spin on things. See, 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 we provide our unique personalities to expressing our love for God. Not a right way. I was in a seminary, a Presbyterian Churches of America seminary, and, and um, Man, they spent an entire year debating on campus which worship style is godly. So we go to chapel. They get somebody on a, on a guitar who couldn't sing. Trust me, they couldn't. And they sing a hymn. Preacher come up. 30 minutes, I've never been so sleepy in my life. And they walked out with such pious views of this is the way. 
And so finally, I said nothing for a year. I kept my mouth shut. They finally brought it to my doorstep in class one day. David, what say ye? I said, all y'all crazy. I said, we're the only right church in America, so I'm going to just make it. Since y'all right, we right too. Since y'all are generalizing, I'm going to generalize too. I'm going to show you all how stupid this argument is. And the argument stopped after that day because I gave them a dose of reality of their heart. You can become so biblically in tune that you lose sight of the heart. Second way to combat racism, first way is get informed. Get informed. Quit assuming. Quit making bad assumptions. Quit making generalizations. You don't know. Get informed. Ask somebody. Ask somebody. Ask somebody. Two, get together. Get together. You'll be surprised at what can happen when we get together. Man, powerful things happen when we get together and start talking about real issues that affect us because we're all affected by life. When we get together, life happens, and we get to share, and we get to share our struggles. We get to share our successes. We get to share so much powerful truths of life. Get together. Look what happened in Acts 15. They came to Jerusalem, and they were welcomed by the church, and the apostles and the elders to whom they reported everything that who did? He keeps pointing this thing back to God. It is God's idea for us to be multicultural. It is God's idea for us to have more than just more friends, more friends than those that look like us. Get together. Let's, let's learn how to be in community with one another. When I come, don't run. And when you come, I won't have views of you like you are the bad guy. We've got to dismiss views we've inherited. And we've got to dismiss victim mindsets. The third way is they got a leader. Who was the leader? Look what it says in verse 7. After much discussion, Peter, woo, Peter, the racist, Peter, the cussing, racist, Peter. <laughs> Interesting that God will use the very person you least think to bring about a powerful message of revolution. See, Peter, before he can get up and tell them about their issues, he had to deal with his own issues. He had to deal with his own issues. Can I share with you all, every struggle you got is to set you up for that grand day when you're on stage and the world is looking at you. Do not despise your lion and bear because it helps you defeat Goliath. Don't despise the testing you're going through right now. Don't despise right now the tension you feel. I, I love it because I feel it. You're like, but, 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 but. And I hear your heart. And you're saying, but, 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 but. And I'm saying back to you, but, 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 God. You know, our church was growing. I think at some point we would have been here. One day, I was a pharmaceutical sales rep of the legal nature, and um, I, was, I was at a meeting. My company told me to go to a meeting that was actually hosted by Brother Parker's son-in-law. It was a leadership meeting, and so my company allowed me to go, and so I went, and there was this church that was there. I didn't know it, but they asked us to go around the room, introduce yourself, tell us what you do. And so I heard all these church people talking about, oh, I'm such and such. I do this at the church. I do this at the church. And I'm like, man, hey, there's a lot of church folk here. And then it came around to me and I said, well, I guess I can share that I'm a preacher. So I said, I'm a drug dealer by, the day, by day and I'm a preacher by night. So at the first break, this little short woman came up to me and said, we want to hear your story. So I began to tell her my story where I pastored in East St. Louis and blah, 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 went down the line and she said, we need to talk. So over the next three years, we've been talking and we start talking and sharing and they would send a group of kids from the suburbs over to East St. Louis and they would clean up the entire area of our, uh, of our location. Half of them was terrified, scared, thought they were going to get killed and shot, but thank God for shock therapy. <laughs> you know, and I took them to the ugly side too. I was like, right here? More people got shot, Doc. You might watch out. <clears throat> and uh, it was funny seeing their faces turn red when I told them that. They was like. And, and so um, we built a relationship and we built a rapport. And we would 
we go over there, we'd worship with them, different style, but, you know, I'm cool. I'm, I'm, I'm loving Jesus, you loving Jesus, let's rock. And uh, my company went through a downsizing. I didn't think I was going to get caught in the downsizing. They said they are letting off the, la- the lower 25% of performers. I was like, I'm cool. I'm top 30. I'm, in the, I'm 13 of 120. You do the math. So I'm in, I, I'm, I'm in good. I'm like, cool. I'm in the top 11%. I get the phone call. Yeah, David, we're dissolving your position. And I'm like, really? You've got to be kidding me. I'm mad. I'm angry. I'm, I'm taken aback because I didn't. It, did, it, it took me by surprise. And uh, that's a whole other story. Because I know some folk who was in the lower 25%, and they still got their job. We'll keep going. Keep going. Praise the name of Jesus. We'll keep going. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Um, they work four hours a day. I work 12 hours a day. Their biggest excitement is when they can put on Facebook, they at the Cardinals game on work hours. Me? I'm working 12 hours, sometimes 16 hours a day. I'm hustling. But it's what it is. God had a plan. So the church found out that I was a part of the downsizing, came to me and said, we want to make you a full-time pastor, and we're going to pay the bill. So we want to offer you a three-year contract, no strings attached. You don't owe us nothing. You don't pay us nothing. You don't, we don't control nothing. We believe in you. And guess what? This church was 99.99% white. Well, they're getting more African Americans there who stay in that area. They're open to multiculturalism. They helped me go full time, which allowed the church now to see more results because we're able to be on the ground level. So they went from hiring one person, while now the church has taken on me full time by ourselves. Not only that, because of their love, we were able to now hire three more people, and two part-time people. See, you've got to understand, when we get together, we get to help each other. Let me hear it. Peter got up, he addressed them, and he said it this way, Brothers, you know that, same t- that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. Peter stood up. He was a leader. Let me tell you all something. In your job, in your marketplace, you need to stand up and be a leader. When folk bring the most sideways jokes to you, say, hey, we ain't on none of that. I don't believe in none of that. Yeah, yeah, we got to work through our issues, but th- th- don't bring that mess to me. When folk, come into, uh, when folk come up to you with certain views about another person because of color or because of socioeconomics, just say, be a leader. Quit being a fight. Yeah, okay. You think that? Ha, 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 ha. No, stand up, get a spine, be a leader. Because you can stop the madness by redirecting the foolishness. So no, that ain't coming, no, uh uh-uh, no, I ain't dealing with that. Maybe it's about a person you know. Say, no, we're not going to deal with that person like that. Have you spoken to them? Have you spoken to them? No, it's not. It's being human. Being the kind of people God called you to be, because God called us to be salt and light. We are to be different. So God uses a man who had racist issues to deal with racism, and he broke the barrier. They got a leader. The last thing is, get a decision. Get a decision. The Bible says in Acts 15 and 19, after they came together, after they got a leader, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. See that? We shouldn't make it difficult for anyone that's different than us. We shouldn't make it difficult. We shouldn't make it difficult. I know a friend of mine who's still a friend of mine, depending on what day of the week it is, but she's still a friend of mine. Grew up in East St. Louis, went to school together from junior high school to high school, went to college together. And as we graduated, she married a Hispanic guy. And we all had issues at first. You didn't sold us out. You didn't sold us out. What about the brothers? What about the brothers? What about the brothers? What about the brothers? You know, can I be? I'm being truthful. 
And she said, in a loving way, forget the brothers. That's what she said. She's a God-fearing, loving Christian. She said, forget the brothers. She said, if I had to wait on the brother, I'd be 90 getting married. That's what she said. But I'm not telling you to lie. That's what she said. She said, I found love. I found love. See, when we talk about getting together, when we talk about getting informed, when we talk about getting a leader, when we talk about making a decision, it means we decide not to make it, not to make it difficult for someone that's different than us. I want to end it on this note. John 13, verse 35, says it well. It's not because of your theological doctrine. It's not because of your pedigree. It's not because of your socioeconomics. It's not because you have a big, beautiful church with a, with a steeple on top, calling it a cathedral or call it whatever you want to call it, that folk know you're a Christian. The Bible makes it very clear your love for one another will prove to who? The world that you are my disciples. Your love is going to prove to the world that you are my disciples. Not what you do on Sunday. Not, not what you do when the company has a kumbaya banquet. And you got a few drinks down and you got enough bravery to talk to somebody of a different race. No, what we do is intentionally show forth the love of God. And Jesus says it this way, and the world will know you are my disciples. Who will know? The world. Who will know? The folk that's not under the same instructions that you and I are under, or that you and me are under. We've got to know that the load is on us to change the world. You got to get that, y'all. Because when it's all said and done, it's not about whose style is right. It's not, about, it's not about, well, I don't have that many friends. Well, yes, you do. You have a lot of folk you pass by. How does God say you will, they will know that you are my disciples if you love one another? Let's stay.